Okay, welcome back. So we've been looking at preparation um, uh, for marriage. How can uh, a couple prepare themselves for marriage? We were looking at um, uh, the importance of preparation. We're looking, we started looking at the, the few, <clears throat> a few uh, areas, and we we spoke about becoming the best you, about how to build and uh, restore your emotional health, and third is personal skill, personal management. Of that, we looked at four specific aspects: that is, one's career, one's finances, the way they manage time, and lastly, um, being able to equip oneself with household skills. So the uh, fourth point, fourth area of preparation as we look at it is relationship skills, relating to one another, OK? So uh, here, when, uh, you know, as, um, uh, as uh, Paul talks of in, in Philippians, and I just like to read that verse, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 5, it says, don't do anything from selfish ambition or from a cheap desire to boast, but be humble towards one another, always considering others better than yourself. Okay, So a relationship like marriage is something that is, that's an ongoing, a lifelong relationship. And so it definitely requires so, uh, good skills of relating to one another. Um, and in order to build a healthy uh, relationship, there needs to be some skills that 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 need to be established. Okay, and of this, uh, we're we're going to be considering um, a few, which is one communication. Then we're going to be looking at <laughs> roles in marriage, and the third we are going to uh, focus on in-law relationships. Okay. Like I said, some of these is something that we will look at in detail uh, even in the chapters to come, but this is basically an overview of this. So to prepare yourself in knowing that these are certain areas that one would need to improve themselves. So the first one is communication. We do see that one of the back, back, a backbone of a marriage is in communication, the way that uh, um, a couple converse and relate to one another okay and uh, the the if when there is a breakdown of uh, communication is when we do see that the marriage also kinds of breaks down so um what why is communication important communication is important is because like like we said there are two people coming from different frameworks and when you're entering into a covenant of marriage one to another uh, you're, you're learning and understanding about each other's framework. You're learning to understand the strengths that people may have or understand how what they are like. So, and, and this can only be done through open verbal communication. So looking at how is it that you can improve in your area of being able to communicate? How best do you communicate? What are some of the ways that you communicate? Some people communicate through very emotionally. Some people communicate very cognitively. But to understand that there are different ways people communicate and to come to a place that works together. <laughs> Excuse me. Also, uh, how, do, how do you communicate uh, that when you are in an emotionally um, maybe difficult space, maybe it's one of anger or it's of disappointment or it's of a dissatisfaction, how would you communicate to be able to see that? Also to see that um, what are some of the strategies that you may be employing in order to uh, uh, get your opinion across or get your understanding across? Do you use threats or do you use certain uh, blackmails, emotional blackmails. <clears throat> so, so we we need to uh, understand that through uh, through communication is how we get to know each other as well as we make ourselves known. So to be able to build on that that area of communication. Okay, the second um, 
relationship skills that we're going to look at is the roles in marriage. Now, when we look at scripture, we know that uh, the husband and the wife, they have a definition or they have certain roles that are defined uh, in the way that God sees it. And scripture shows, and again, like I said, we're going to be looking at this in detail, but just an overview. The husband is the head and the wife is a co-heir and is also someone who should be involved in family matters, in family decisions, okay? Um, again, when you're looking at roles, how do you, what do you look at um, shared responsibilities? How do you see your roles in the responsibilities towards the marriage, towards children, towards finances, towards the family, towards spiritual maturity? Where are you at in, playing out these roles. So a lot of times, the, the roles that we assume um, uh, kind of reflect the roles that we see maybe in our own families. But then to align ourselves with what God has instructed uh, should be the roles uh, is what we really need to redefine and restructure and realign ourselves to. Okay, even in roles in marriage to see whether you are a good team player, whether you're able to work and uh, work alongside with your spouse to take some of those responsibilities to move forward. Okay, one aspect of um, uh, uh, relationship skills is the, the area of uh, relationships with in-laws, in-law relationships. So we, what we mean by in-law relationships is the families. Um, uh, the families, that is the parents of the groom as well as the parents of the bride. So it is necessary or important to define clear boundaries in the relationships that one shares with their families, with uh, family members. Okay, um, there, there of course is, is a, a, it's a recommended guideline is to be able to maintain a healthy distance with family members. Now, this does not mean that you do not support or care or help your family members. It does not mean that. What it means is no family member should be allowed to interfere with the marriage or with the decision-making process. Okay, so um, the, the couple together come and learn, uh, understand, make mistakes in uh, making decisions, learning to work with one another, rather than having the larger interference with the family. Now, this the reason why this is brought up is because, especially in some cultures that we, we've noticed or we've seen, and, and some of it in, in our, our culture, in the Indian culture that we do see, is that parents become key decision makers and um, that connection or that emotional attachment <clears throat> is not severed well enough. And as a result, there can be strong interference and thereby uh, there can be issues within the marriage. Also, another thing to determine is um, after marriage, will, will the couple be living with the family members or will they be living uh, apart? Uh, now, even if it is it is with the family members to be able to ensure that uh, that 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 sanctum or that um, uh, that diet, the inner diet of a husband and a wife, is preserved and not intruded upon, uh, either knowingly or unknowingly. Okay, so that's uh, that's those are the three points that we would we we want to highlight in relationship skills communication roles in marriage and in-law relationships, okay? <clears throat> Any questions here before I move on to point five? Any questions or even welcome to have any comments also or thoughts? Usually this is a place that we have a lot of questions. So I'm surprised that there aren't any. Okay, let me move on. Now, going to the fifth point is um, is how you prepare yourself in learning or taking time to overcome um, what you've gone through in your past. 
Now, this could be either uh, any kind of a difficult negative situation that's happened, okay, uh, like an abuse, or maybe it is a traumatic experience that you've had, or it could be certain life situations you've come from. Maybe it's uh, a negative uh, a home environment, right? Or it could be um, difficult members of the family that one has dealt with. So it's to be able to overcome the impact of these uh, of the past before you enter into marriage. So um, I think even as I'm saying that, um, it can it, it's definitely something that needs to be addressed but uh, it could pop up even after it may be addressed or um, it's looked at there can be chances even remnants of it can come up in marriage okay but it is it's something that you 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 are aware of and receive your healing on uh, of it and renew your mind from the impact of the thoughts or the emotion, emotional space it has brought you into. Okay, so being able to renew your mind through that. So we would see that uh, uh, a lot of times, I mean, go through any story of a person, and you will, you would have heard certain unpleasant experiences in the life of people, right? And these experiences have the potential to cause deep wounds, deep scars, emotional pain, so much so that um, it becomes habitual patterns in their lives. Okay, But uh, as believers, we know that God is the one who helps us overcome because he is the overcomer and he has called us as overcomers because we are born of God. And uh, we believe that he's the one who can change all things. He can um, uh, heal, he can restore our soul, bring us release from the pain of the past trauma or of the past hurts. Um, but of course, to be able to do that regularly to go to him. So when we, if, if we aren't doing that, if we don't receive that healing for whatever has happened in the past, we carry this into the marriage and that affects our spouse or affects the marriage. Um, so as we had said earlier, right, that uh, many sense that if you enter into marriage, all that's happened in the past, the rejection, the abandonment, the pain that's happened in the past will somehow change in marriage. But that isn't true. Okay. So some of the areas that uh, we just want to focus on is like abuse. If any, if uh, the person has been a victim of either physical, emotional, or even sexual abuse, it's important to address and uh, heal from these experiences. Um, because these negative experiences that one deals with, like I said, carries an impact into your current behavior, into the, car into the way that your attitudes are, into the way that you relate to people. So often, that often what we've seen is especially people who are abused have a difficulty to trust, have a difficulty to engage in good intimate relationships because of the fear of being manipulated, fear of being rejected, of being abandoned by someone that they trusted, right? So, and that becomes like, um, like a, uh, like a wall, like a like a protective barrier, so they put up guards uh, so that they don't have to trust anyone because of the fear of of being hurt and pained. So if someone like this comes into marriage, um, there's always there is an, it, you know there's that wall that's there, and there isn't uh, a place of openness and vulnerability that they see. So even when we're looking at abuse, we also understand that um, uh, marriage is no place for any form of ab abuse, right? Physical, emotional, mental, or anything uh, that uh, uh, that can hurt uh, one another. So uh, even if you've come from a place of abuse, 
um, maybe by parents or by someone, when you're entering into marriage, making a commitment that that will no longer, uh, that you will no longer resolve to abuse either spouse or children or anyone. Okay. The second area of overcoming is any past addictions. <clears throat> now, addictions uh, could be any type, which may be uh, any kind, any form of substances. Um, it could be gambling, it could be sexual addictions. So to prepare and to understand if uh, you are, if you, if you have been at any point of time hooked to any form of an addi addiction. So if that is so, to be able to make a decision, to move away, to receive that freedom, to get whatever support that you may need uh, in the natural, maybe if it is rehabilitation or counseling, uh, um, to to ensure that you've moved away from that, um, and also to receive spiritual wholeness through those forms of addiction. Again, by renouncing um, your sin, by by coming to God and and uh, repenting and moving forward in freedom. The other <clears throat> uh, experience we're going to just quickly going to look at is certain home environments or experiences. So there can be times when, when there have been uh, issues of separation or divorce in in the in the lives of your of uh, a person's family, either in their parents or extended homes, um, and because it has happened. Often people go with this thing of, okay, it's happened there, it can likely to happen here. So it's not something that you either entertain or you anticipate in, in your uh, marriage. Okay, um, uh, We see that sometimes marriage is as a last resort measure, especially in situations um, that may be very difficult. Okay, And it's not something that you progressively keep thinking about. So even in arguments, refuse to make statements that, you know, um, let's get a divorce or let's, uh, you know, let's just separate. Uh, not really, you know, bringing that up as, as, a, as a means of escape. Okay? Even, so, so to be able to really heal from what has been as part of the home. There could be even times where there's been infidelity, where there's been unfaithfulness in, of, in your family's marriage, right? And uh, how have you seen this? What have you taken away as a meaning? Uh, and you know, what kind of uh, commitment are you making of that this not happening in your own marriage? There could also be certain, like I said, there could be in, uh, uh, people or um, having wrong examples, people leading uh, leading lives that have been incorrect, or they have been wrong models, where their behaviors have uh, tended to affect us. Um, like, for example, you know, to to be able for um, maybe one of the parents have had extreme tempers, you know, extreme anger. So much so that they would walk out of the house. They wouldn't talk. They would lock themselves indoors. There would be, um, you know, they would move away for a month and only then come back. So, the the tendency for these more these behaviors or these um, these people to be examples, they they become they are incorrect patterns of dealing with stress. Right? And uh, these things have to be unlearned. These things have to be changed. So you will, as a, as a person getting into marriage, you're intentionally unlearning what you have seen, maybe something your parents do, either the way that they have thrown a temper, the way that they have used bad language, or how they've resorted to mm, other forms of coping that's not been biblical. So to make a commitment that you will follow through healthy biblical patterns in relating to your spouse and your children. Sometimes even previous relationships can affect the marriage. So being uh, emotionally or sexually involved with other people uh, before the marriage um, can, yes, affect. Uh, to, to have made a commitment that you will completely break off any form of contact 
or renounce any kind of emotional or sexual affection towards them. And to come to a place of uh, repentance where you're under the grace and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So knowing that you've received his forgiveness um, and that you are in a place where you, you are free from guilt, free from that embarrassment, free from that, that shame, right? Because any time you're trapped in guilt, it can, it can make you feel very, very gripped in despair. Or if there's feelings of anger or bitterness, it can lead to further strife or it can lead to not having intimacy. So to be able to find uh, peace and healing um, uh, from the trauma uh, and to, to move into uh, a place of hope. Okay. So even previous relationships, so you're also making the commitment to break away from every relationship that can impact your marriage, uh, any relationship that's been there in the past or anything in future that, um, mm, that could impact your marriage. Okay, so that's point number five. Um, okay, Rins brought about, uh, I think, two questions. She said, about keeping a healthy distance with your parents, it will be hard, especially for those who are strongly attached. What about them? When and how should they do it? Okay. So we recognize that uh, especially for those who are significantly attached to their family, it is a hard thing. Nevertheless, it is something that is a command of the Lord. It says, leave your father and mother, cleave to your wife and become one flesh. So the uh, it's a good thing to start when you realize, or when, I don't think it's about age or any of that, but as an adult, so this is also, um, you know, a recommendation to parents, if there are parents in this group, of um, to be able to allow your son, your daughter, to make their own decisions right from a time that they have reached a place of adulthood, 18, 19, 20, you know, for them to take ownership and responsibility of their own lives rather than um, you being always there to handhold or spoon feed them. So it is recommended that if you realize that you have very strong uh, attach emotional attachments to your family, right now is a good time to begin to establish those healthy boundaries, right? Making decisions on your own. Yes, it's always it's good to take their uh, understanding, but nevertheless, making those decisions on their own. How should they do it? A good way to do it is to start. Start right away, take decisions of your own. Get into healthy conversations with your family that it's a healthy practice to, um, you know, just speaking to family and saying, maybe, you know, I'd like to take this decision on my own and like you to support me, even if I make some of those mistakes. Because if, if we've all seen our lives, we've not always made perfect decisions. We've made mistakes, but we've learned from those mistakes. So oh, keeping that communication open with your family to give, to ask them or to request them to give you a chance to start doing things on your own, to start working things and rather having having to be spoon fed. Okay. It's not usually sometimes it's not taken very well from the by the parents. Nevertheless, it's something uh, you need to grow in maturity. And in time, they would also understand if you treat them with respect and honor. It's not about getting upset and angry with them, but treating them with respect and honor, yet being able to have an agency of your own responsibility and your your and things that concern you, okay? Uh, your next question is, victims of past experience who are unwilling to undergo changes, how should we encourage and counsel them? It's a good thing to encourage them to meet somebody else rather than you counseling them because uh, some of these past experiences uh, go really deep, you know? it It has deep emotional hurts. And often um, counseling them actually 
actually takes it's it's just not asking them not to feel that way but it is to help them process those feelings and those thoughts and uh, dispute some of those beliefs that they have formed from within and uh, you know it also helping them through scripture to find new systems of belief so i would suggest that you encourage them to get help rather than counsel them because if if that's something that um you may not be able to do it is best to encourage them to get help to to speak to someone who is able to receive that support it is important to share with them however that any past experience or trauma of a past experience can significantly impact their current and their marriage that's something i think you can tell them and encouraging them to get help from from someone who is more trained will probably be helpful okay all right so we look at the sixth point there's just two more points six one is um sexual purity now one of the uh, uh, an important aspect in marriage is um uh, is the area of sexuality so but as you're preparing for for marriage um it is to um, b- before you enter into that space of intimacy to be able to break free from every prior sexual addiction whether it be pornography masturbation homosexuality being involved in anything sexually explicit it is to break free from that and um uh, to to really consecrate oneself in bringing your appetites in submission to <clears throat> to god and also seeking his power in seeking his help uh in in uh, restraining in bringing about uh, a sense of restraining in the way that uh, uh, you know you in in the way that you've been addicted so uh, to to keep your body pure and to keep your desires pure by going back to the word and going back to the help of the holy spirit in addition if there is something that you may need to get support and help from someone on how to break addictions um you know just also a f- form of counseling that's also something that will be recommended so uh, to uh, also to understand that every um every form of sexual need is to be met only within marriage and not uh, uh, within marriage and by your spouse and not anything outside of that so you make that commitment to not uh, uh, engage in sexual fulfillment anywhere outside of your marriage now this this is just not um when uh, this is of course when we mean, when we mean out extra marital affairs but we also mean any form of uh, uh, sexual stimulation either through movies or through pornography or through masturbation to make that commitment that you will seek um sexual fulfillment only from your spouse the second one is intimacy is um as you preparing for marriage you're also committing that you will uh you will keep uh, uh sexual enjoyment uh, only for a time uh, after marriage to be able to keep uh sex within the boundaries of marriage and not outside of it okay um so that's the sixth point of sexual sexual maturity the seventh one uh, any points any any thoughts on that and the seventh point is uh, christian maturity calling and ministry okay now um when we i just would like to bring up out a, a, a verse here in ephesians chapter 4 verses 12 and 13 and let me just read read this out to you he did this to prepare all god's people for the work of christian service in order to build up the body of christ and so we shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the son of god we shall become mature people reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature so when you look at this verse uh, you know it's it's clear that as god's people we are called for 
service. We are called to build the body of Christ. We are called to come together um, in our knowledge of God, and we are called to do things um, reaching to the very stature of who God was. Okay, so uh, in our spiritual growth, what are we looking at? Is to be able to ensure that we continue, um, even as we're looking into these other areas of life, we are continuing to ensure that we grow in maturity in our spiritual walk with God. So as we enter marriage, we are continuing to grow spiritually. And that we do by our disciplines, how we discipline ourselves with our time with God, whether it be reading of the word, whether it be a time of prayer, whether it be time of worship, uh, a time where we spend in, um, uh, in, in speaking in tongues, in, in our times of ministry, what do we do to establish our own spiritual growth, spiritual maturity? Okay, uh, and and it is it's always good to at the, even in your time of preparation to understand how your spouse also um, um, what kind of disciplines they have as they are growing spiritually, and also to come to a place of understanding how you can support one another in your spiritual growth and either through prayer or worship or reading the word together studying the word together how do you support and bring about that sense of maturity the next part is uh, christian calling so um, in we believe that all of us have a place of function in the body of christ is something that god has called us to do okay and uh, uh, there's uh, some of us may be aware of, of God's calling in our lives, some may be just discovering, some may be in a place of seeking. Okay, So to be able to come and seek God for where he wants to use us, what he is calling us for, and how we could support our spouse to fulfill what God has purposed for them or what God has destined for them. So not just for yourself, where you're able to uh, uh, understand or come to a place of discovery of God's calling, if you haven't already discovered God's calling in your life, and how you can support and help your spouse to reach the calling that God desires of them. Okay. Also, uh, uh, when we're looking at calling, to know that when God's calling your spouse to something, it's, it's to be able to also help to release and work and partner with them to uh, so that they could ful fulfill what God God has for them. Okay, um, uh, so as uh, uh, it's also I think it's a good thing even in before in marriage to understand what your individual callings are and to see if they complement one another. If if you if you can see that you know you can work together in God's kingdom. Um, because, uh, for example, one person maybe has a calling to, you know, to work in a big city. The other person has a calling to work in a village, right? And this don't complement one another. So it's a good thing to understand that in the first place, because working together can do a lot for the kingdom of God. So uh, developing these areas and growing together so that they can minister one with with another. Okay. So these are these are the seven specific points that uh, uh, we we look through. Now, certain additional things that um, you know we recommend as part of this pre premarital preparation is that the um, the couple spend a lot of time in studying God's word and also um, uh, you know e even even things about marriage, understanding. A lot more about marriage, and there are many Christian books that are available, um, you know, so that they can share and discuss what what they have learned. To be able to also, as a part of the preparation, to really have open, constructive conversations, especially in these seven areas. Um, you know, often we found that uh, that um, a lot of couples discover so much just through this second chapter, you know, as we've spoken about this, um, you know, some things, how they see money or how they see partnership or how they see uh, their past, all of that 
it it draws a lot of light into what they may be going through so to help them to engage in that constructive discussion and it's important to talk about these areas and to hear about what each one may be may be feeling okay also to bring up any issues or problem areas that you may see, feel uncomfortable with so that that can be discussed rather than dismissing anything that you see or dismissing what you feel rather than that it is to bring that uh, bring that up okay uh, and also when when a, when a couple is um, engaged to be married to be able to keep some of those boundaries and uh, ensure that they keep to the focus of honoring god uh, through their through their engagement period um, what we're going to look into the next chapter is about expectations and this is a huge conversation that couples need to make to really express and share their expectations of one another expectations of how they see marriage expectations of how they see um, family all of that to to really work through all of all of this okay all right so uh, as a summary we looked at seven main areas of preparation we spoke about becoming the best you we spoke about emotional uh, health relationship skills personal management um we looked at uh, overcoming past issues past experiences abuse um then even sexual purity and the last was uh, the calling christian calling and um, christian uh, christian ministry okay so these are seven areas of preparation so something that i generally do when we go through this is you know um they kind of if you look at if you look into the page later there is a there is a rating that you can give yourself a preparedness rating that you can give yourself from 1 to 5 1 being least prepared and 5 being well pre prepared and uh, once you have understood that uh, that you know how much maybe you've put yourself a 2 or 3 or 4 uh, what are some of the things that you can work on so that's something i make the couples do and um, at the end of the course i go back to this and check with them as to how much they've grown how much they have actually intentionally prepared themselves for in these areas okay all right um any questions any questions any observations any thoughts i would be glad to hear some of you speak yes. Also, can you please repeat your question again? So I said, do you have any questions, any observations, any thoughts? I said I'll be glad to hear you all speak. Okay, uh, Chira has asked, "Ma'am, how to know that he or she is the right person for me to marriage?" Okay, so that's something that we are going to look at in chapter three. Okay, how do you make a choice? How do you know, or how will you make a choice whether it is the right person to be married? So I, I'm asking you to patiently wait for next class, Chira. I hope you don't have to make a decision in this next one week. to bury somebody okay if there are no questions we can have an early stop i know we're almost 10 minutes early but uh, we can we can may i request any one of the students to kindly close with a word of prayer <clears throat> Ravali can i request you to pray Ravali if you're there Asha I like um, like how you are teaching I mean especially this subject um it's not something new but uh, lots of it is 
in like a more detailed um, manner. And uh, I mean, I, I mean, I um, these are really good as for people us who are like preparing ourselves um, for the future. So yeah. Okay, I, I think what you said is. Uh what is being taught is not new however they are in detail and they are helpful and they help you to have some kind of guidelines i think that's what you said yeah please go for that okay could somebody close in prayer Ravali? Um, think, yes you know i can yeah close. go ahead yeah thank you jesus for this time thank you uh, for giving us uh, this opportunity to learn from your word um, we pray god that everything that we have learned discussed today in our class uh, that you speak to us personally to uh, reflect and respect things in our life and also to apply it practically in our lives oh god uh, help us to prepare for the future lord jesus and help us to walk with you in this journey in jesus name i pray amen amen, amen. Thank you all students. I'll meet you all next Thursday. And uh, yeah, with the chapter three, we're making a choice. So Chira, do ensure that you come. God bless. Have a blessed week ahead. Thank you.